Okay, we're in Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 16, and uh, we're looking at God in three persons. Now, of course, we're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, what is the Trinity? I'll allow John Piper to tell us. He states the doctrine of the Trinity means that there is one God who eternally exists in three distinct persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Of course, you immediately ask the question, well, how on earth am I to understand that? But the doctrine of the Trinity wasn't given to us uh, as a math problem, because actually one plus one plus one equals one. It would be very, very confusing. It is actually true that if you times one times one times one, you still end up with one. Spurgeon says, when it comes to biblical revelation, it's not your duty to comprehend all truth, but to apprehend God's truth and to do so by faith. But many deny the Trinity. Uh, they protest that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, he mocked the idea of the Trinity, say, describing it as the hocus-pocus phantasm of a god like another Cerberus with one body and three heads. Well, poor old chap. Uh, they deny the the doctrine of the Trinity, and then others destroy the doctrine of the Trinity. You have Karl Barth in the 1800s and Karl Reiner in the 1900s who believed in what they called modalism, or that may have been a name applied to what they taught later. But they deny the Trinity. They do not believe that there are three coexisting members of the Godhead. No, God exists in three modes of being. So God the Father, wanted to come to the earth to save people, and he became Jesus. So when Jesus was praying, he was essentially talking to himself. And then he says in John 16, I'm going to heaven, uh, and I need to do so, otherwise the Holy Spirit will not come to you. So he went there and, I suppose, you know, became the Holy Spirit and then came down to earth. Now, United uh, Pentecostals, they teach modalism. This is otherwise known as the oneness theology, if you ever bump into that. There's a famous preacher, the TV preacher called T.D. Uh, T. Jakes, who was a oneness theologian, but he has recently uh, changed his ways and has become a, a Trinitarian. Now, of course, the great problem with modalism is exposed when it encounters a text like the one we just read. And I'll read it again. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. As soon as Jesus, that's God the Son, was baptized, he went out of the water at that moment. In fact, notice those two phrases, as soon as and at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God, God the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven, that's God the Father, said, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. I remember very well John MacArthur addressing that very text and saying, well, there is far too rapid change of hats here for modalism to possibly exist or be true. Many deny the doctrine, many destroy it. Of course, Satan hates the doctrine of the Trinity, which is why it's almost the profile of every cult that they deny the Trinity. And why does he do so? Largely because he wants to destroy the truth that Jesus is divine. How important is it to believe that Jesus is di divine. Well, it's pretty important because it's very important to destroy it as far as if you're Satan. Uh, in John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus says, the Father judges no one, but he has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that is himself, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That is, he who does not honor the Son as to the same degree that you honor the Father. Satan knows that you cannot be saved if your faith is in a Jesus who is not divine. Because just a bloke is not going to be able to save anybody. And in John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus added, I, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I claim to be. And then he says again, you will die in your sins. Who did he claim to be? John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Now, so you've got people that deny the Trinity, you've got people that, that just destroy the whole thing, and then 
a lot of us are all dazzled by the Trinity because it's really hard to comprehend. I don't know that it's possible. People have labored to communicate it um, in, in different ways. They've said, well, it's, the Trinity is like an egg. You have the shell, you have the yolk, you have the white, and it's all part of the one egg. But the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are not parts of the Godhead. Each one of them is God. Um, some have compared the, the Trinity to water. And they say, you see, it exists in three forms, liquid, vapor, and ice. But then again, the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son are not forms of God. That would be what? Modalism. Jared Manning said, an infinite God cannot be fully described by a finite illustration. I thought some of the observations of Dr. Nathan Wood, uh, who made these observations many years ago, is quite interesting. He, he pointed out that, that everything God makes is triune. Uh, the, 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 the triune nature of God, and the creation is, set, is supposed to glorify him, is stamped on creation. The universe is divided into space, time, and matter, and each one of those is divided into three. So uh, space is composed of length, breadth, and height. Time is past, present, present and future. Matter exists in solid, liquid, and gas. And actually we're uh, modeled after the Trinity in the sense that the scripture tells us that the, that the human being is made up of a spirit, a soul, and a body. But there's no point being dazed and confused about the Trinity because God never intended that. He just wanted you to apprehend it by faith. Um, Anne Leonard, she said, you don't need to understand the hypostatic unity of the Trinity. You just need to turn your heart over to the, to the one who created the redwood trees. So all that matters is what does God say about it? And then we'll just believe it. Okay, well, what, let's go through it. <clears throat> First of all, the Bible teaches very clearly that there is only one God. Uh, God's own testimony says that in Isaiah 45, 21. And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, <clears throat> excuse me, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So he's saying quite clearly, there is only one God. There is no other God. There is no other savior. That's God's own testimony. That was the testimony of the prophets and the kings. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, Isaiah 37, 20, <clears throat> Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. And then thirdly, there's the testimony of the apostles. In Romans chapter 3, verse 29, Paul says, There is only one God who will justify. And then in Ephesians 4, 6, we read, There is one God and Father of all. What about the testimony of Jesus? What did he think? In John 5, 44, he says to his critics, How can you believe if you accept praise from one another and you make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? And of course, you know, monotheism is just an anathema to the unbeliever, to the unregenerate. They can't stand the idea simply because if you assert that there is only one God and it's this God, you are necessarily saying that all the other gods are false. And that is exactly what you're saying. Uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, he said intolerance is essential only to monotheism. The monotheistic God will not allow other gods to live. On the other hand, belief in many gods is belief in tolerance. It is to live and let live. No, it's to live and let die. Even people who are not hostile to your faith in Jesus Christ will become instantly appalled if you do not positively affirm their falsehoods. So what does the Bible teach? It teaches that there is only one God. But it also teaches that this one God consists of three persons. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word for God there is Elohim, and Elohim is in the plural. In fact, every single case where Elohim is not referring to God, it's always translated as God's plural. 
uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, we just looked at, at first seems to negate the, the doctrine of the Trinity because he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the Lord is one. But then when you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, singular, our God, Elohim, plural, the Lord is one. So what's he communicating there? Hear, O Israel, the one Lord, our triune God, is God. Amazing, wonderful statement. Then you've got another name for God in the Old Testament, which is Adonai. It appears over 300 times in the Old Testament, and that is also in the plural. Now, most of the time God speaks about himself, he speaks in the singular, but there are places where he, he's unapologetically plural about himself. Um, in Genesis chapter 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our own image and likeness. Genesis 3.22, and the Lord said, man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom shall I go for us? Who will go for us? When the sinful people were erecting the Tower of Babel, God said, come, let us go down and confuse their language. So what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that there's only one God. But he, this one God consists of three persons. And it teaches that these are three distinct persons. Uh, in John 14, 16, Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the, the Spirit of truth. So right there, Jesus did not consider himself to be the Father or the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 8, verse 16, Jesus said, If I do judge, my, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own Lord is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am the one who testifies myself. The other witness is my Father who sent me. So, right, just that passage, the Father and the Son are clearly presented as coexisting different people, but the same. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 35, Jesus says, The Father loves the Son. In John 14, 31, Jesus said, The world must learn that I love the Father. In John 17, 23, Jesus prays, May they, believers, be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you, Father, have sent me and have loved them, <laughs> the, the believers, even as you have loved me. So again, you, you've got the Father, you've got the Son, you've got believers. They're clearly three separate entities. The Father is distinguished from the Son. But the Holy Spirit is distinguished from the Father. In Numbers 27, 18, so the Lord, as the Father said to Moses, take Joshua, son of another man, in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him. David in Psalm 51, verse 10, is praying to the Father, and he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a spirit, a steadfast spirit within me, and do not take cast me from your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from me. So the Holy Holy Spirit is, is distinguished from the Father. And then you've got passages where the Son is distinguished from the Father, and, and they're both distinguished from the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 6, where Jesus tells his disciples, I, the Son, will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. There you have all three. And they're, they're clearly three distinct persons. Well, not only that, the Bible teaches that these are three co-equal persons. In John 5, 22, Jesus said, All must honor the Son just as they honor the Father. We just read that. Well, how could you possibly say such a thing if, unless you were an equal uh, Matthew 28, 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They must all be equal. They're presented as equal. You can't say baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and John MacArthur. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, both passages clearly demonstrating that there's not only three distinct persons, but there are three co-equal persons. Uh, there are also three divine persons. First of all, we're told that the Father is God. Uh, John 6, 27, God the Father has placed his seal of approval on the Son. Romans 1, 7, grace and peace to you from God our Father. So the Father is God. He's divine. But then we're told that Jesus is God. 
in Hebrews 1, verse 8 and 9. We have a very interesting passage there because here we have the Father talking about the Son. And he says, but about the Son, he, the Father, says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. So there's the Father calling his own Son God. How clear is that? John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and so who is the Word that was with God and that was God? Verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's Jesus. Jesus is God. Just in case you think we're interpreting them wrong, how about verses like this? Romans 9, 5, that Christ, who is God over all, forever blessed. Get around that one. Uh, I mean, how do you do... How, if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you pretend to believe in the Bible, you've clearly never read it. Colossians 2, 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. 1 John 5, 20, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. I, mean, I, I guess we could go on, but we'll move on. The Holy Spirit, we're told, is God. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Peter says to Ananias, he said, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? You haven't lied to man, you've lied to God. He calls the Holy Spirit God. And then of course you discover the, the Trinity in, in, in all of God's attributes. Um, the person of the Trinity is engaged in the same work. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus is quoting Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, and he's applying it to himself. And he says, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of the Sovereign Lord, that's the Father, is on me, the Son, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Right there, one statement, all three members of the Godhead are engaged in the same work. Uh, then we're told that God the Father is unchangeable, or if you like theological words, he's immutable. <clears throat> um, Malachi 3.6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. Thank God that he doesn't change. He doesn't change in his commitment to us. He doesn't change in any way. Um, but we also find out that the Son of God is unchangeable. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, God the Father is eternal. Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were born, or you were brought forth, or, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. But then God the Son is eternal. He claimed to be eternal. In John 5, 58, he said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit is eternal. Well, it would be if it's God's Spirit. But Hebrews 9, 14 actually calls the Holy Spirit the eternal Spirit. First John 3, 20, God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. In John 16, 30, the disciples say to Jesus, now we know that you know all things. And 1 Corinthians 2, 11 tells us the Holy Spirit is the only one who knows everything that God knows. Okay, let's keep going. God the Father created all things. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Then you get over to Colossians, you find out Jesus created all things. Really? Colossians 1.16, speaking of Jesus, says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That sounds like a description of God, doesn't it? I mean, but he created all things. How is this possible that they both created him? Well, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 tells us. It says, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. So the Father created all things through the Son. Uh, you find out that in John chapter 1, as we just looked at in verse 1 and in verse 14, that Jesus is the Word. You go back to Genesis, and you find out how did he create everything with the, by the Word. He spoke it into existence. Did the Holy Spirit have any part in this? Psalm 104 verse 30, when you send your Spirit, they are created. 
Okay, let's finish with this. Why is the doctrine of the Trinity so important? Well, it makes a lot of people upset. Well, truth does make a lot of people upset. But let me give you just a few reasons why it's so important. The first reason is a very simple one is the, the Bible is the revelation of God himself. You don't know who you are till you find your, who God, something about who God is. You'll never know what a sinner you are unless you, unless you have some concept of how holy God is. And, and we're not supposed to tamper in any way, shape, or form with who God declares himself to be. So as it, it, difficult it might be to, to understand how you can have three permanent, eternal, coexisting, divine people in the one Godhead. But it doesn't matter. That's not the point. Is God declares himself that way over and over and over again, and we're not to mess with it, not to tamper with it. I'll give you a second reason, though. Not only is it God's revelation of himself, but actually it wouldn't be valid for him to reveal himself if there weren't a trinity. Where do you get that from? Well, in John 5, 31, Jesus declared, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. That's a spiritual law. Okay, which is why in John 8, 18, we've, it, the Bible's very clear to know that the Father who sent me, Jesus said, bears witness about me. So the Father bears witness about the Son, and in John 3, 11, 5, 19, 14, 7, to 10, we read that Jesus bears witness to whatever he has seen and heard from the Father. And then uh, the Holy Spirit in, in John 15, 26 says, will not speak of himself, but he will testify about Christ. So each member of the Godhead is bearing witness to another member of the Godhead. So circumventing what might have otherwise left him, left, left him testifying to himself in a, in a way that, what, that Jesus says wasn't valid. So without the Trinity, it wouldn't be fully valid for God to bear witness of himself, to reveal himself. And then thirdly, without the Trinity, we could never perceive any revelation from God. The Father has to reveal divine truth to people or they will never comprehend it. In Matthew 16, 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Uh, John the Baptist in John chapter 3, and I think it's 27, he says that man can only receive what is given to him from above. You, you can't, you can't, you, you can have to have a revelation and it has to come from God the Father. But then you look in the scripture and you say, actually, uh, you'll never receive any revelation whatsoever unless Jesus reveals it to you. Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27, nobody knows the Father except the Son, Jesus said, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And how is he revealed? The Holy Spirit has to reveal him. Ephesians 3, 4, and 5, the mystery of Christ, which has now been revealed by his Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So the Bible's God's revelation of himself. We're not to tamper with it. It wouldn't be fully valid for God to do it if it wasn't a trinity, because he can bear witness to himself without bearing witness to himself. And then uh, we'd never be able to perceive it. That being the case, the final point is that without the Trinity, we could never be saved. That's because God the Father is responsible for saving us. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. He initiated, it's the whole plan is from the Father. But then the Son is the Savior. Matthew 1, 21, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But you still need the Holy Spirit. And Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, He, Jesus, Jesus saved us, not because of good works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy. That's the Father's mercy. How? By the washing and of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So God the Holy Spirit is entirely responsible also for saving you. I'll, I'll finish with a quote from, guess who? Spurgeon. He says, Nothing will so enlarge the intellect Nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, and continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. O oh, my soul, is it not enough? Dost thou need more strength than the omnipotence of the sacred trinity? 
Dost thou want more wisdom than exists in the Father, more love than has displayed itself in the Son, or more power than is manifest in the influences of the Spirit? Learn then, O believer, to love all the persons of the divine Trinity alike. And may the many texts that we went through this morning enable us by his Spirit to do just that. Let's pray.